and welcome to a Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Reish, your host, and I'm very excited about today's show. We have arguably some of uh, the world's leading experts on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, this is a very important topic, very close to my heart. As you know, my, my reversion back to the faith came through the form of seeing an image of the Shroud without even knowing what it was. Um, and so since in my own personal journey, I've come a long way in discovering more and more about this very important artifact, um, the burial cloth of Jesus. And there has been skeptics over the years on this, but more and more evidence is mounting. I want to introduce you to two gentlemen. Um, let me introduce you to the first one, Robert Rucker. He is the founder of the shroudresearch.net website and done extensive uh, research on the topic. So excited to have him. So welcome, Robert. Thank you. And also uh, our guest is Russ Briolt. He's also the, the founder of a website called shroudencounter.com as well as shrouduniversity.com. Um, so welcome, Russ. What? Nice to be here, Charbel. Um, now, just, uh, I mean, this is the first time you've been with us in the audience. You are planning a conference coming uh, to Australia that will have uh, all these different, um, I guess, props and things that are coming uh, it's it's something you you have done for a while. Uh, we're very excited that later in the year you will be coming down under. Um, but m maybe let's talk a bit about the work that you're doing, and then would love to unpack a bit about what people can expect in that conference. But should I start with you, um, Rob Robert, or should I call you Bob? Uh, if you're happy with Bob, uh, go ahead and call me Bob. That's fine. <laughs> well, Bob. Um, can I start with you? Just a little bit about your background and how you got involved with researching on the Shroud. Oh, well, yes, my, my background is that um, I have a master's degree in nuclear engineering and I was in the uh, uh, nuclear field uh, working for about 38 years. Uh, but all that time there was uh, uh, an interest that I had in the Shroud of Turin because when I was about 12 or 13 years old, uh, there was a magazine that came out with a Sunday paper called Parade. And in that newspaper, there, there was a little uh, uh, image about an inch and a half tall of a, of a man with hair parted in the middle coming down and looking straight at you. And uh, there was only about three or four sentences in the, in the paragraph describing it. But the last sentence was uh, many people believe that this uh, image from the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. And I thought, well, that can't be. Everyone would be uh, so um, enthralled with this that it would be, everyone would know about it. And, but then I thought, well, I need to be a little bit more open-minded than that. So when I finally found a book on the subject, I started reading on it. Uh, and it's always been in the background for 38 years while I was working in the nuclear industry. Uh, and so for the last nine years, I've been putting in pretty much full-time uh, on the subject, uh, writing at this point uh, 32 papers on, on the subject on, on the research page of shroudresearch.net. Wow, wow, that's, that's fantastic. I encourage uh, people to get onto that website. Um, let me uh, go cross over to you, Russ, um, uh, very quickly. Uh, a bit about your background and, um, yeah, and how you got involved with researching for the Shroud. Well, I've been at it for a very long time. Um, this is my 40th year of uh, being involved in the Shroud right out of college. And in fact, I was, um, is, you know, just to, in, in 1978, we will talk further about this, but in 1978, you had a whole team of American scientists go to Turin, Italy, for fi uh, to study a religious artifact. They had five days, hands on, round the clock, and this was unprecedented. I mean, I mean, you, you, it could never happen again, and so it was huge news. News articles coming out, and then of course, you, you may know that in June of 1980, National Geographic, they did a big spread on it. I was a writer for the college newspaper, and asked if I could write some articles on the struggle. I thought it was really cool. And so they gave me the permission to do it. And so in the, I had several months to prepare, read several books, uh, talked to some of the scientists on the phone. And I wrote my articles, which appeared as a two-part article series in the fall of 80. And I was hooked. 
I'm saying, man, this is one seriously cool mystery and nobody knows anything about it. And, um, and so I, I, I said to myself, is, is that it? Is it over? I mean, is, 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 just, is these, this article just my swan song? And I said, no, this is incredible. And so in October of 81, I attended the first United States Scientific Symposium on the Shroud which is when all the scientists gathered in a, a two-day conference to present all their various papers. And those papers were subsequently published in 24 different peer-reviewed journal articles. That's where I got to meet everyone involved in shroud research, whether it's, you know, whether it, we're talking chemists or physicists or historians or archeologists. And, and so for me, it was all about being in the right place at the right time, it just, um, and it just, it's so I've been involved ever since. And um, so, um, so that's kind of, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, I have a master's degree, but it's not in, in physics or anything. It's, uh, it's actually in marketing. So it really <laughs> comes in handy with like websites and things, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but not so much with shroud research, but I did know, but from, but from my seven years of college, I do know how to read a book and I do know how to study. And I do know how to do research. And so from that, and so now I've read every book on the, in the English language and have annotated all of them. And um, so that's where we are. <laughs> every book um, on, on the topic of the shroud. I'm in the sure. English language, <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, so how, do you know, uh, what is the uh, number of books? Just curious, uh, roughly, would you know how many that is? Are we talking... Uh, I don't know. I have at least 20, 30, 100 40, here in my library. 100, wow. And it's, wow. uh, there's probably more that, you know, you know, some books are great. Some books aren't worth the paper they're printed on, you know, okay. so they're, uh, <laughs> they're, um, so the, um, but the, all those books have come in handy as I'm in the process of writing my own book and, need, and needed all those books to do my own research. So, yeah. Yeah. The, w- what uh, is, um, uh, as far as yourself, uh, with books, uh, you are in a project one. Was there any others that have come uh, to light? Will this be the first uh, for you? This is my first book. I, I've concentrated okay. as a lecturer and a researcher on the Shroud. I have done probably close to 2,000 presentations and at uh, colleges, universities, churches, um, you, you name it. And it's... Um, and so, and I've done a lot of DVDs and video uh, of the Shroud. This is my first endeavor into the, into the printed word. And it's been three years in the making. And so no wonder I haven't done it until now. I never realized it was going to be this much work. And uh, yes. <laughs> so, wow. but it's well worth it. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to it. You think uh, before the end of uh, 2022, yes. uh, can yeah, we look forward I, yes. to it? It should be out by then. Fantastic. Oh, we pray it goes well. Um, but Bob, uh, yourself, uh, you, have you yourself read all those books as well? But you, you, your angle of research of the Shroud, um, I think the two of you complement each other in the sense of what, what you look for and the, the way you describe uh, the research. Can, wh- what would you say, I guess, in your field, what um, I guess separates you, I guess, from, from the other researchers? What, what angle of the Shroud are you sort of interested in there's so much of it but but you yourself uh is there anything um that i guess differs from from your research to the others yes well my background 38 years in the nuclear industry all that time i was running nuclear analysis computer codes or software uh, to do a nuclear analysis on uh, nuclear reactors uh, and uh, uh, nuclear fuel production uh, and also uh, for a few years was involved in uh, measurement measurement uh, of fissile material in sealed containers uh, and uh, doing the statistical analysis uh, on those measurements. So uh, then about uh, uh, two, 2011, uh, I would say, I became aware of Mark Antonacci's book, uh, The Resurrection of the Shroud. That was the first book that I well, no, it was it was the first recent book that I'd read on it. I'd read a few others before that. But uh, as a result of reading his book, then I called him and, and met with him, uh, and I told him what I could do, that I thought that it should be obvious that this is what 
you know, if you're serious about doing research on the shroud, what you need is a person to, to run nuclear analysis computer calculations on it. Uh, and so I, I set those calculations up and I, I ran about uh, four to 500 such calculations on my desktop computer. So I, I approached this from a scientific perspective, trying to solve the carbon dating problem for the Shroud of Turin. Because when the carbon dating was done in 1988, uh, the, what I believe to be the you know, false date was produced. Uh, and not, not the true date is what I'm saying. Uh, and, and that it, it significantly reduced the amount of research and possible funding and time that was being committed for research on the shroud. So it was very detrimental. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, I was convinced that there must be something wrong with the carbon dating of the shroud. Uh, the measurements would have been done correctly. But, but even when you assume that, uh, the, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio that the experiments were measuring had been altered by something so that even though the measurements were correctly giving you the correct ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, those ratios had been altered to give you a false date. And so that was my conclusion. So I spent about six months doing these calculations. Each one would take about uh, nine to um, 13 hours on my desktop computer. They're very extensive calculations. And uh, I, I was running a computer code that would uh, calculate the path of one neutron at a time as it would be uh, emitted and then re reflected and scattering through, through the body, the cloth covering them, and the limestone tomb as it would have been designed in first century Jerusalem. And, and so I had the computer code follow 30,000 neutrons in, in order to give me uh, answers that are statistically acceptable. Uh, and so I have to restart those calculations because a lot of other issues have come up. But as a result of, of those calculations that I did in uh, 2014, I then reported the results at Mark Antonacci's conference in St. Louis uh, later that year uh, and brought the, the results of just one series of about a dozen cases out of the 500 that I ran. Uh, because you can't communicate at all. You have, to, you have to reduce the amount that you're trying to communicate. Uh, and, and so that's what got me into this. Uh, and uh, so I have been trying basically to replace the most popular explanation for the carbon dating. The most popular explanation now is the invisible reweave hypothesis. Now, you have to realize that, that when the carbon dating Results were published in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1989, uh, that there were several different uh, options that were proposed to explain why the date seemed to be from the Middle Ages, where so there was so much evidence that it really was the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. So the question is, how in the world do you explain this? So that as a result of my calculations, um, uh, I, I think my calculations have, have done a good job uh, of producing a workable hypothesis to explain the carbon dating because the result is consistent with the four things that we know about carbon dating as it relates to the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and if I could just take a you know, short time to explain what those four things are. Please do. In other words, a, a, a good hypothesis has to be consistent with the evidence and it has to make predictions that when tested are found to be true. Now, uh, so that's what a hypothesis is. It doesn't have to, you don't, you're not claiming that it's true, but you're claiming that it's uh, valuable uh, because it's consistent in, and that it could be true because it's consistent with all the evidence and it makes testable predictions. So the four things I think that any hypothesis to explain has to be consistent with is the date. Uh, the raw date was 1260 plus or minus 31. Uh, that raw value was then taken and adjusted 
uh, to account for the changes in the carbon uh, 14 concentration in the atmosphere to end up with a, a range of 1260 to 1390 AD. Uh, and if that were true, then that would falsify the Shroud of Turin, that it couldn't be uh, the authentic era cloth of Jesus and date uh, from 1260 to 1390. So uh, I made the assumption that neutrons were emitted homogeneously from the body in a burst of radiation. And that burst of radiation not only created the image, but also included neutrons, uh, which then uh, scattered throughout the tomb, uh, including uh, being absorbed in nitrogen-14 on the cloth to produce new carbon-14 that didn't exist before. And that's why the carbon date was shifted from the first century, time of Jesus would be, death would be about 33 AD. It was shifted from that point up to 12, 1260, plus or minus 31, by neutron absorption in nitrogen 14 to produce new carbon 14, thus shifting the carbon date. So to say it briefly, you know, I can go into a lot more detail. But, but that's my explanation to the carbon dating. And that it, is, it is consistent with the date, with the slope of the data. In other words, the three different laboratories didn't produce the same date. They disagreed with one another. And they produced a slope uh, relative to the bottom of the cloth. And my calculations produced, reproduced the, that same slope as the experiments obtained. Uh, the experiments also obtained a range or distribution of the subsample dates. There were 16 subsample dates, and my results are consistent with that. It also gave a way to explain the sudarium of Oviedo being dated to about 700 AD. Now, that's believed to be the face cloth of Jesus, and my calculations indicated that if that face cloth of Jesus was placed on the side bench in the tomb, it would indeed date from 700 AD, exactly what the experiments have shown. So in all respects, this neutron absorption hypothesis uh, is consistent with everything that we know about the carbon dating of the Shard of Turin and, and the Sudarium of Oviedo. It's fascinating um, what you're saying there because it's a, uh... It just reaffirms, you know, why why we can jump to conclusions. You know, if carbon dating gave us one date, and then people throw out the window, this is not the authentic burial cloth. But then, fantastic that you were able to come back with with that. And um, if I can turn to Russ, uh, Russ, um, uh, carbon dating was one issue, uh, and and people did uh, have. Uh, a bit of a debate about the authenticity of the shot. What other issues popped up in your research um, where people disagree? So, so this, could you share with any other sort of, and, and then I'd love to sort of spend the rest of our time after that, looking at all the other, uh, as many, as many. Um, yeah. I, I, think, of I think what's really important, you know, if, if you have, people listening and for the first time uh, have heard about the shot of Turin, then, then they're, they're, they're already, you know, probably, you know, saying, Whoa. <laughs> and uh, so let me, let me just back up a minute. You know, the shroud is a 14 foot long linen cloth. It's made of flax. It's been in Turin, Italy since 1578. It was in France for several hundred years prior to that. And it was, uh, Historically, we know it was in Constantinople prior to that. It's got a long history and it can be reliably dated just through historical references um, all the way, at least back to the sixth century, which obviously predates the carbon date by about 700 years. So, in, you know, Bob's done great work on the, on the whole neutron theory. I've kind of holistically looked at everything and historically, there's no question that the carbon date is wrong. The question is, how wrong is it? Um, so is it is it first century? Um, you know, I think it is. Um, but but let me just continue on with this, because this this 14 foot long linen cloth is bears the faint image of a bearded, crucified man. 
front and back image, five foot ten in height, approximately. The has a pattern of wounds that correlate with the gospel account of what happened to Jesus, starting most significantly with the crown of thorns, a whole pattern of bloodstains all around the head, puncture wounds. And this was a this was unique to the crucifixion of Christ because he was because people claimed that he was king of the Jews. It was a mockery. So not everyone received a crown, a crown of thorns as a routine of crucifixion. Secondly, you have a man who's brutally scourged, scourge mark, whip marks all over the body, at least 120 scourge marks. Wow. And so now you're asking, well, because we know that the Romans generally expected those who were crucified to remain alive as long as possible, because it was as, as it was as much of a spectacle as it was a form of execution. And so why was Jesus scourged so badly if the Romans intended for him to, to remain alive on the cross as long as possible? And the answer is because Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea at the time, did not believe Jesus was guilty of a crime worthy of capital punishment, didn't want to kill him. And so the first thing he did, as you know, he sent him to King Herod. Herod sent him back. Then he tried to trade Barabbas, and that didn't work. And so finally, he has him scourged to within an inch of his life, thinking that when this bloodied hulk of a man came walking back into the courtyard, that the people would say, OK, that's enough. You don't have to kill him. But that didn't happen. So it did, in spite of being brutally scourged, they still wanted him crucified. And so the fact that we now have a man with a crown of thorns, brutally scourged and no one's in the wrist, no one's in the feet. And a wound in the side. Now, why a wound in the side? Because the scripture says that when the soldiers came back by in the afternoon, because the because Passover was going to be the following day and, and, and the high priest did not want any of these bodies to be hanging on the cross during this high holy day of Passover. So he asked that the bodies be taken down. Well, they came to the first thief on one side of Jesus. He was still alive. They broke his legs. They took a large wooden mallet weighing about 15 pounds, shattered the bones under the knees, can't stand on broken legs. They, then they shattered the, the legs of the second thief. Then they came to Jesus, and the scripture says, but when they came to Jesus, they noticed that he was already dead. Therefore, they did not break his legs. Um, therefore, fulfilling the prophecy that not a bone of not a bone of him will be broken. But what did they? But what did they do? Then they. But now Joseph of Arimathea, he's the man who purchased the linen shroud in which Jesus would be wrapped in. He's the same man who owned the tomb in which Jesus would be laid to rest. Well, he'd gone to Pontius Pilate to request permission to take the body of Jesus and give it and give Jesus a private burial. So now they're waiting for Joseph to come back. And but before they could release Jesus to be over to Joseph for burial, they had to make sure he was dead. So they stabbed him in the side with a spear and out flowed what appeared to be to John as blood and water. But it wasn't. It was blood in the separation of blood and blood serum, which looks like water, but was proof on the shroud that this was a postmortem bloodstain, a blood, a wound that occurred after death. All the other wounds were occurred prior to death. Only the side wound occurred after death. Wound wise, everything is consistent with the gospel account. But then you have another enormous anomaly here. Is that the shroud is a very complex three to one herringbone pattern weave. Doable in first century using first century loom technology, either in Egypt or Syria. And but it is very rare because it's expensive. Well, what does the scripture say? Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, purchased a fine linen cloth. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, what the Shroud of Turin conforms to that, Joseph of Arimathea would have had the means to purchase this cloth. But more significantly, what is the anomaly here is that rarely would someone crucified be given an individual burial almost never would he be wrapped in a rich man's shroud and placed in a rich man's tomb 
And that's a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 9. It says, he shall make his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. How do you do that? Crucified, criminal's death, in between two thieves, yet wrapped in a rich man's shroud, placed in a rich man's tomb. Everything biblically correlates with the shroud. Historically, there's no question. Now, this may seem simple to some, but it's big when it comes to the history of the shroud is that we know now for a fact that the shroud was in Constantinople in 1204 and was stolen during the Fourth Crusade. This is important because the shroud that was stolen in Constantinople didn't, didn't just get there in 1204. It had been there for hundreds of years. Now, this is significant because, as, as, as Bob pointed out, the oldest carbon date takes us to 1260. Well, 1204 is already older than the oldest carbon date. And it didn't just get there. It had been there for a long time. So we know for a fact, historically, that the carbon date is wrong. And, you know, personally, I think everything would indicate that this is a first century artifact. It's a first century, a genuine Jewish burrow shroud. And so but but let me just continue just for one more minute here before I let you <laughs> figure out where we're going to go next is that you see. The, the intriguing debate here, the either or proposition that always must be kept in mind with the shroud is that it either is the authentic burrow shroud of Jesus or it's not. And if it's not, well, then what is it? What's the alternative? It must be the work of some kind of human effort, some kind of human artistic endeavor. If that's the case, then there must be some kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain. There must be some substances on the cloth to account for the image. But there aren't. I mean, they have five days hands on with this cloth. All this gear, spectroscopy, infrared thermography, X radiography, photomicroscopy, on and on and on we go. Published in 24 different peer reviewed journals. And there's no paint. There's no substances on the cloth. We have a whole pattern of blood stains. Is it just paint? Is it animal blood? Is it human blood? Is it blood from actual wounds? Well, it is in fact human blood, human male DNA. We detected that in 1995 by analyzing the DNA from a blood stain taken from the back of the head. So everything checks out that this is the that this is the image of a real human being who died from those wounds that we see on the cloth. And everything lines up with the crucifixion of Jesus. So who else is it? And because if it's not authentic, then someone please tell me what it is and do not tell me, oh, it's just the work of a medieval artist because that artist is not identified. He does not exist. So I'll, I'll end my time and you can do it wherever you're going to go now. Yeah. Charvel. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much for the history. I uh, was conscious. I wanted to make sure we do get a quick background of, of what is the, what are we talking about? It's the burial cloth of Jesus. So that's uh, beautifully uh, articulated. So thank you very much for us. Uh, it's just very exciting because, um, uh, you know, we, we're seeing more and more evidence mount uh, on this. And, and I love how you put that. It, it either is or it isn't. And if it isn't, who is it? Um, that's brilliant. Um, can I can I turn to you, Bob, here? And and I, I mean, so we know that if there's no ink, if there's no, if, if there was no artist. So you mentioned in your piece earlier that um, there was this radiation. I mean, the radiation for we can't even replicate uh, this type of image from radiation today, can we? Or have there been any, any people trying to replicate passing of an image, <laughs> this X-ray type image with radiation? I mean, if we were to try replicate that, what does that equate to? <laughs> it's some huge well, number. Uh, surprisingly, uh, yes, yes, they actually have to an extent. Uh, uh, Paul de Lazaro in Italy has been running uh, uh, experiments with his lasers. Uh, to, to produce coloration uh, on the uh, linen fibers and threads. Uh, there was uh, another effort in, in a paper that came out probably two years ago. I believe this was a, a French effort. Uh, and they wanted to uh, basically uh, use, instead of ultraviolet light, like Paula de Lazaro was using, they, they used infrared light from, uh, from an infrared laser. Now, it both 
Paolo de Lazzaro in Italy and this French effort, what they found was that to produce the, the image with similar discoloration uh, and similar locations of the discoloration, it had to be extremely rapid laser pulse. Uh, and the French effort came to the conclusion uh, that, that their laser had to be down in the uh, femtosecond range. Now that's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. That, I think that's a billionth of a trillionth of a second. So, so that the pulse had to be extremely short. Now, no human being without this modern equipment could do that. Now, so what they did was that they used a femtosecond uh, uh, infrared laser uh, and, and then controlled it with information from a photograph of the face so that they were able to, to use that radiation controlled by information to produce actually the best replica of, of the face on the Shroud of Turin. But that's what it takes to reproduce the Shroud image, a femtosecond, uh, alt, not ultraviolet, but infrared uh, laser controlled by information. And that's what I think actually, uh, in a way that tells us what could have produced the image. It's, it's a product of radiation controlled by information. Now, it, it, because there's three things to produce the image that you need. Uh, you need some type of uh, mechanism to discolor the fibers. You, secondly, you need information to drive that discoloration mechanism. And thirdly, you need information to control that discoloration mechanism in order to discolor the correct fibers and the correct length of those fibers in, in order to produce the image of a, a crucified man, both the front image and the back image. Uh, and so you have to get that information. Well, where was that information available? It was only available in the body. So that if you looked at the body, you could see a crucified man because you're looking, your eyes are receiving the information from that body, which is then processed by your brain, so that you then come to the understanding that what you're looking at is a crucified man. So that you, when you look at something, what you're seeing is based upon information that's being transported to your eyes by reflected photons. And the same process produced the image on the shroud. So that the, we can see the image on the shroud be, because the information that defines the form of a crucified man has been encoded into the pattern of the discolored fibers on the shroud. Absolutely amazing. It, it yeah. must be authentic. There's no way that someone prior to 1578 or 1356 or 1204 could do this. Absolutely impossible. So, so that this is high tech to the ultimate extent. Yes. So that the image was produced by an extremely rapid, uh, could have been in the nanosecond or femtosecond range, a burst of radiation to burn the image uh, of the encoding the information into the image, simultaneously releasing neutrons, which shifted the carbon date. And I think probably simultaneously thrusting the dried blood off the body onto the cloth. Because dried blood, there would have been a lot of blood would have dried on the body. Uh, the, the, how do you get dried blood onto the cloth? Because dried blood would not absorb uh, in the fabric. It has to be thrust off. And such a burst of radiation by radiation pressure would do just that. Thank you very much for that. I mean, that's uh, yeah, mind blowing, literally. I can imagine, I mean, it, it is fitting just hearing it. If we were to think about what at the moment when Jesus, I guess, rose from the dead, but if you think about the moment he came back to life, having this radiation, this ex almost explosion, if you like, this explosion of light, it's very fitting. It makes sense in my mind that, and, and the evidence is there. We have this evidence in this cloth, it makes so much sense.
But that I want to stack up if I can for our time here, almost like a list of, of, of reasons why you believe the shroud is authentic. So we've gone through um, uh, now this radiation. It's an image that seems to be pretty much impossible to reproduce, especially in those times. Um, uh, the other thing is that there is actual blood. You said it was dry blood. Now, Russ, you referred to the, you actually could test the blood. I'm curious, do we know the blood type? Uh, you said it was oh, a male. AB. AB. AB blood type, AB blood type by uh, forward testing and then also human male DNA. Uh, XY chromosome, so nothing nothing weird about the chromosomes. All, okay. I got a lot of questions about that because, um, and then um, um, also um, just to verify that it was blood, um, they took one, uh, one gene off of chromosome number 11, something to do with the blood. I can't remember what it was, but they, but they cloned it, which verified that it was in fact blood and not paint can't clone yeah. paint. And exactly. it's, um, and so that was very important too. And, um, but the, uh, but what they got was very degraded. Uh, so they really can't tell, you know, you wouldn't be able to, recreate the the genome of jesus based on what we had it was far too too degraded to do that but it was a but there was enough information to get what to get what we just what i just mentioned amazing so what what more can we add now to this list um of the evidence that's stacking up here to say that this and i'm i'm obviously very convinced about it um and and there are many now becoming more and more convinced um the significance of this this is a, a a relic, if you like, a real first first class relic of, of the best type you have of, of our Lord. Well, I see, I see off to your, I think it's your left shoulder on the bookcase. You have an icon of Jesus. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right, right there. And what's very interesting is that, um, you, you know, why do all of the Orthodox Byzantine icons of Jesus conform to what was known then as the true likeness, mm. the true likeness of Christ, not made by human hands, beginning in the sixth century, which is when the shroud was kind of rediscovered in, in Edessa, which is today would be in Southern Turkey, about 400 miles North of Jerusalem. There's not enough time to go into the whole historical trail, but from the sixth century on, all of your icon images conform to the true likeness, long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, flattened nose, stylistically looking very similar to what we see on the shroud. Mm. All of your Byzantine coinage with the image of Jesus on it all conforms to the, to the, to the true likeness. In other words, prior to, prior to the revelation of the true likeness, there were pictures on the catacomb walls. There were many other mosaics of Jesus that have him short hair, clean shaven, sometimes long hair, but still clean shaven, sometimes looking off to the left or to the right in some kind of a profile view. But after the revelation of the true likeness, everything conforms to a front facing Jesus, hair parted in the middle, long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, flattened nose, and it never deviates. And it's, um, so what was the source? And, and so, you know, uh, art historians would say, you know, that image has to, had to have a source. And it's, um, we believe it's the drought. And it's, um, uh, I'm going to mention a couple of other things that, that do it for me. The yeah, whole please. pattern of, there's a whole, the cloth is covered with limestone particles. Microscopic, you got to magnify 2,500 times in, in order to see them. But it's the exact same. It's called travertine aragonite limestone. It's the same kind of limestone that is common to the hills and tombs around Jerusalem. Um, there is the presence of magnesium limestone, which is often which is characteristic of dolomite. Dolomite is common to to a very to a to tombs in Jerusalem that are of a very hard, dense rock formation. Because, you know, if you had less financial means, you would build, you would, you would have a tomb in the very soft limestone. Easy to do, easy, 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 easy to cut out of the rock, not very expensive. But if you had money, 
you go for those tombs that are really built out of hard rock, which is exactly where the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre is. And who would have the means to do that? Joseph of Arimathea. And it's so, so there's limestone particles specifically um, called, it's called dolomite or it's a magnesium limestone, which would be typical to that specific tomb. And it's, um, but now I think this is the coolest thing that people don't really realize. The, yeah, I, you'd probably have to throw up a picture of the shroud, but, but let me just say that if you look for any of your listeners that look at a picture of the shroud, the first thing you're going to see is a whole pattern of burns because the shroud was in a fire in 1532. It was kept in a silver box and the top of the box melted and a glob of molten silver fell down onto it, burning all the way through it, creating a series of burns and not almost like this origami burn pattern. And, and so the image lies be between these parallel lines, which are essentially scorch marks and burns and patches uh, from this fire. Mm. Now, the, um, the next thing you'll see is you'll see a whole pattern of water stains all over the shroud, but in a very specific pattern. Now, it's interesting. Researchers... Um, in, uh, um, uh, I'll give a, a, a principally Italian researcher, Aldo Goreshi, and, and he has, he has had, a, had a partner, uh, a science partner, I can't remember his name. But anyways, they did a presentation in Dallas in 2005 that just rocked my world. And what they showed, they tried to, they, they recreated the folding pattern that had to occur to replicate the burn. And they did that. That's easy to do. Just fold it up until all those burns line up. Right. And um, but what happened is, is that is that when they when they when they line up all the burns, guess what doesn't line up? The water stains. The water stains don't line up, which tells you something. It tells you that. OK, then that means the water stains are on the on the cloth that we always thought was when they put the fire out had nothing to do with the fire. So then they recreated the folding pattern to, re to replicate, to, re to see how the shroud had to be folded in order to replicate the water stains. Completely different from the burn folding pattern. And the only way that they could replicate it, if you can imagine the cloth out in front of you, 14 feet long, fold it in half, fold it in half again, and then, and then fold it like an accordion, this way, that way, this way, that way. So you have 48 layers. Yes. So it looks, so it's a, now it's a nice little package about the size of a record album, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, the dimensions. And, but then they had to roll it and place it into a vertical container. Now, every... Every representation, everything we know about the shroud, how it was stored historically, it's been kept in, in wooden boxes. It's been kept in metal boxes. It's been folded. It's been ever in 1578. It was it was on it was on a roll. It was rolled up. OK, now in Turin, it's kept flat. The whole thing, 14 feet flat. So nowhere in history do we record, do we have a in any kind of. Um, historical record of how the cloth was 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 folded and then rolled and then stored vertically. Now, one of the one of the characteristics of those water stains is that what makes the water stains appear is a calcium deposit around each water stain. That's why you see the water stain because of a calcium deposit. Where was the where was the shroud stored? It was stored in a jar of clay, just like we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. How did they store important documents circa first century, circa, you know, um, in, in, the, in the Middle East? They stored them in jars of clay. And what happened is, is that some water got into the bottom of that jar, into, into that clay jar, and, 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 and probably sat there for who knows how long until someone pulled it out and realize, oh, well, we just made a mess of this cloth. The, um, the, um, but I think personally, when the shroud was taken from Jerusalem to Edessa, probably by wagon, probably there was a rainstorm 
and 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 water got into that into that earthen jar. That's how those water stains were formed. That to me, not only places it circa first century, but even gives you the location, which is the Middle East. I think that is one of the coolest pieces of pieces of evidence that really just continues to to rock my world when I think about it. Amazing, amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that. My, uh, Bob, can I turn to you and say, is there any other piece of evidence you could add here uh, in our discussion, even if it's one or one, one or two uh, uh, that we haven't discussed yet? Oh, well, the problem here is limiting it to only one or two. There's so many different <laughs> so, evidence. <laughs> I know. That, that's right. So that, you know, it, it's when someone comes to look at the Shah of Turin for the first time, uh, and they match it up with their perception uh, just out of our culture of what Jesus looks like. And they see the Shroud of Turin and they say, there's a match between what I understand Jesus looked like and what the Shroud of Turin uh, is. And the reason for that is that our understanding of what Jesus looked like is based on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, and that, that's, I think that's clear. And so I think just the first a person who's not investigated this, but just for the first time, he sees the shroud and says, well, that's just like Jesus. And immediately there's a response uh, of authenticity, that this is the real deal. Uh, and that they saved it all these years because it was the real deal. Now you, you stop and think about what would the, uh, the apostles, the early Christians, done with the burial cloth of Jesus. Uh, it had Jesus' blood on it, certainly. Now the image may have taken weeks or months or years to form. We're not quite sure on that, but it certainly had Jesus' blood on it. And Jesus' blood in theology was extremely important. Uh, and so they wouldn't have burned it. They wouldn't have thrown it out. They wouldn't have reused it. What, they wouldn't have intentionally destroyed it. Matter of fact, they would in, in every sense tried to prevent people from destroying it. So they would have kept it. So where is it? It's the Shroud of Turin. It's one and the same. Wow. Now, in the, the first uh, a painting, about 550, sometime in the 6th century, like, like Russ said, uh, shows, shows the face, shows the you know, perfect frontal view, parted in the middle, a little, little longer hair on one side than the other, little place in the beard where they, they've been pulled out. Uh, you know, all these different... Uh, facets uh, of it. And then in 692 was very important because uh, that's the earliest coin that we have, Byzantine coin, a gold salatus uh, with the image of Jesus Christ on it. Now that's significant because the emperor would have had to take his image off to put the Shroud of Turin on. And that's significant. So that it was well known, it was extremely well respected. Now, I, I have a gold Sabatis from uh, 692, which shows that. I have another coin, which is interesting, from uh, uh, 1229 uh, or so, uh, which, which has the image of Jesus on the front. On the reverse side, it indicates who the, the image is. Jesus Christ, King of Kings, in capital Greek. So they knew who the image was. We've just forgotten over these, you know, we're, we're, we're so advanced that we've forgotten the important things. <laughs> wow. But yes, the, the Shroud of Turin, uh, I'd like to say, is the second most valuable possession of the human race next to the Bible itself. Because the Shroud of Turin testifies to the receipt that God gave to us <laughs> so that the Shroud of Turin is a receipt. Russ knows where I'm going with this. Because this is his, excuse me, Russ. But uh, yeah, so the, the, when you go to buy an article, you get a receipt which shows where you obtained it and the price it was paid. And that's what the receipt uh, for our, our salvation is in the Shard of Turin. It tells where our salvation came from, from God himself. We didn't earn it. It was provided by God. And the price it was paid was the death of his son. Amen. So the Shroud of Turin really is, I think, the second most valuable possession of the human race. Just amazing. It, we're only scratching the surface. We've been going for about an hour, and it's just been scratching the surface. 
so you're saying there's so much more and that, that's what we probably have to get you on again but but maybe uh just very quickly on the websites and then i'd like to uh close on the on the conference coming up later in the year but just on on the websites again russ can i go to you uh your website again and and what can people expect to see there well, shroudencounter.com is uh, uh, more about uh, what I do as a lecturer and a presenter on the Shroud. And some there's some there's some videos there that you can watch. Uh, Shroud University is a is just an archive research site. There's about a half a dozen international conferences that are available on video. Um, Fantastic. And and so. Um, so if you really want to get deep into the weeds on this topic, you can go to Shroud University. Now, there is there is a there is a five part course you can take that's on Shroud U. It's all free. Um, and mm. it was um, and it's um, it's uh, it's the, the uh, course was um, was done by a, by a Ph.D. in mathematics who is uh, has since passed away. But he did a but he did a really good job with it. And you can. And you can download his PowerPoint slides. You can download his, his, his syllabus, his outline. It's all there on Shroud U. And you can take this little, um, this, um, it's like probably, yeah, probably five hours worth of context, you know, and it's all, all divided into, into, um, into, into five um, courses. And that's, um, so that's, that's free for anyone who wants to, um, to uh, look at it. Um, Thank you. Was that and, uh, any link there? Uh, we, there is a course uh, the Marja Center have promoted on the Shroud as well. Is that similar or is it a different one? Uh, have you? That's seen different. Uh, okay. That's in terms of the coursework. Um, okay, excellent. The, uh, yeah. So there's and, yeah, so much. We have partnered, as people know, uh, at the Perusia Academy with uh, the Marja Center and um, Credible Catholic uh, Father Robert Spitzer, who gave an introduction course on faith and science. And a component in there is he discussing the Shroud. And he points to people who want to go deeper. There's another course. There's, there's so much information. Can I turn to you, um, Bob? Um, what your website again, and uh, and what can people expect to see there? Uh, my, my website is shroudresearch.net. Shroud is spelled S-H-R-O-U-D. Shroudresearch.net. Uh, and I have several pages there. I, I believe it's my third page is the research page, and that's where I list my uh, 32 papers. Uh, that I've written on the subject. Excellent, excellent. Well, please make uh, sure you take advantage of that and go to those two websites or three websites. We'll put them up on the screen and in the description below as well. Don't miss it. Um, thank you very much. Can I now just this conference as we close? Uh, you're coming out uh, down under. Um, November is the date that's penciled in. Is it confirmed? Are we, I mean, depending on the borders, I guess, uh, and what's happening with. Uh, um, with everything around the world, but uh, can, can it's, it's, what are the details? I think, I think it's as confirmed as we can get it at this point, given all this COVID nonsense yeah. and um, and the borders, as you said, and and it's um, and um, so uh, we're probably in, in course now with the what what is this new variant Om, Omicron or Omicron, yeah. I, anyone, I can't even say it. The um, you know so. Who knows how that will be ginned up, you know? So, um, uh, <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's, it's on as far as we know. And, um, you know, in, 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 you know, so um, hopefully we'll be making plans to be there in November and we'll be in um, uh, multiple locations. I think we're going to be there um, at the, um, um, at the, um, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta get john on here to talk about that's, this conference. that's right i'll get i'll get john uh, to to share uh, some information what 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 can we expect at the conference well you can expect um a, a lot more of what you've been hearing from me today and um and we'll go into a lot of different areas um i'm uh, we'll we'll do a, a thorough review of of what the shroud is, where it's been, its long history, all the science, all, and then then we'll of course we'll explore the crucifixion based on the shroud. We'll explore the resurrection based on the shroud, and and you know and um, you know Bob touched on the on the on the forty nanosecond burst on a UV laser, and um, and and how that relates to the to some descriptions of the resurrection that are right there in the Bible. And, uh, you know, how many of you know that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 or so, you know, in the, 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 where Paul says, 
you know, I mean, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means to remain dead, but we will all be changed. How? In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Wow. And it, so we will all be changed. So Paul's talking about a future event. Hasn't even happened yet. Yet he's talking about an instantaneous event. Sure sounds like 40 nanoseconds to me. And it's uh, so we'll, we'll 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 talk about things like that. And um, so and Bob will Bob will uh, will razzle dazzle you with 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 all kinds of uh, you know, theories on, uh, on 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 how neutron flux is, is not only responsible for the image, but also for the aberrant carbon date. And uh, so so, Bob, I guess it's your turn. Anything you can add? Well, we're going to we're going to be laying laying out. Um, a, a sequence of, of uh, Russ and me alternating on various topics uh, that will cover many hours. Um, and so in my experience, if I'm the only one speaking at a conference, I can speak for maybe three hours and 20 minutes or so. And then my voice starts to give out. But, uh, you know, if, if we wanted to have a good long conference. So Russ and I will be alternating to give each of us uh, our voice a, a rest uh, in, in between. So we'll be laying out the topics. Yes, we'll be going into you know various levels of, of detail. We'll, we'll take the the uh, kind of the, the beginners material and, and present that, and we will be presenting some some more uh, detailed, highly detailed scientific uh, issues as well regarding w what we believe really does prove the authenticity uh, of this cloth. As, as being the second most valuable possession of the human race. Oh. Thank you That's so incredible. much. Just uh, so, just finally, as we close, uh, the the meaning of all this work you've you both have done. Uh, what does this mean? I mean, uh, we, people might think, okay, great, it's a burial cloth of Jesus. Uh, what does that mean for me and my relationship with God? How does that change anything for you, Russ? Personally, I, I could see the passion, the zeal, uh, and I know that. This has rocked your world, as you said. What, what could you add? Just finally, what has the Shroud of Turin done for your personal faith? Um, if you could share this that as we close. Well, it just it 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 deepens your faith to know that these things are true. Mm. I had a I had a church I went to one year, and I presented Shroud Encounter, and the, went back there the very next year for an encore presentation was walking into the foyer of the church with the pastor. And there's this woman standing there and she's wearing a postal uniform. So she is their mail carrier. And as she, as we're walking in, she looks at me and says, I know you, you're the shroud man. And I said, guilty as charged. And then she says, well, I've got something to share with you. And I said, well, please do. And she says, well, when you were here last year, you know, I was so taken by your presentation that I gave my life to Christ. The, my boyfriend who I was living with at the time, he gave his life to Christ. We both now come to this church. So I asked her a question. I said, what was it about the shroud that was so impactful for you? And she said this, she said, it makes it real. That's it, it makes it real. I mean, so many times, I mean, we are bombarded with secularism that wants to trash our faith, to tell us the things that, 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 that what we believe are nothing more than some kind of mythology, you know, mm. that, that all the time we, we, are, we are surrounded by secular attacks constantly. And the shroud stands as a testimony that Jesus is real, that the crucifixion happened. That the resurrection happened and it's the most significant event in human history. And, you know, because, you know, just like the either or proposition that we give with the shroud, it's either authentic or it's not. And well, the same thing can be said about Jesus. He's either the son of God or he's not. But the whole point of the resurrection was to validate everything he said, everything he told us. All everything is confirmed through the mm. resurrection. And, and so and, and so this is the significance of the shroud, that it that it stands as the silent witness to the entire world that says that says it's real. 
believe me, you know, and maybe it's maybe part of it saying, and I'm coming soon. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I remember, remember there's a bumper sticker I saw one time. It says God is watching and he's not happy. The um, you know, so 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 maybe maybe part of the message of the shroud is uh, and uh, just this way that, you know, we can we can help make our faith a little more real. And I think that's yeah, what wow. it's all about. Thank you very much for sharing that. That's brilliant. Uh, Rob, did you want to? Uh, yeah. Any any comments from you? Oh, oh, yes, yeah, certainly. <laughs> um, in a court of law, there's three types of evidence that a, a prosecuting attorney can bring uh, against an individual. Uh, uh, those three categories would be context. What, what is his character shown in the past? What has he said in the past? Then there's eyewitness testimony. Did someone see him commit the crime? And then the third aspect is circumstantial, scientifically based circumstantial evidence. Uh, which is, uh, for example, uh, the gun was fired recently, or the bullet that killed the man uh, came from this gun that was owned by the individual, things like that, circumstantial evidence. But in a person coming to Christ, uh, think about it a little bit. There is context. There's context in the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah in, in Isaiah 53, that he would be killed, he'd die, He'd be killed, and yet he would live on uh, uh, and, uh, you know, appreciate those followers of him. So he'd die and yet live on. And then context again would be uh, Jesus' predictions of his own uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Though the apostles didn't understand it at the time, they took it figuratively. Uh, they, they only believed it literally once they saw the uh, the empty tomb with, with the collapsed burial cloth. So the, the, the two items of context would be Old Testament prophecy and Jesus' statements of his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and then the second category is, is uh, uh, personal observation of the empty tomb and the post-resurrection appearances. But Christianity has not had anything readily available to offer in the way of circumstantial evidence until now with the Shroud of Turin. Scientifically based circumstantial evidence on the Shroud of Turin for the resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes it real. And now I also point out that Jesus, uh, in Paul's discussion of the Jesus' resurrection, his resurrection is the first fruits of those who will follow so it's an agrarian analogy. So that if you go in the early spring and you and you pick a green fruit off a tree, you take a bite of it and you say, oh, that's that's an apple. That tells you that, that it's an apple tree and all the other fruit will then be apples. Well, same thing here, that everyone will be resurrected. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Both the ungodly and the godly will be resurrected. The ungodly, for judgment, for penalty, degree of penalty, the godly for degree of rewards. But everyone will be resurrected like Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Shroud of Turin is impactful to every individual who's ever lived. Love it. Uh, I could go on and on. This is amazing. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. It's just in this this brief moment together, it's just deepened my faith even further. Just hearing all this, and I really hope it's it's done the same for our viewers and, and listeners. Um, thank you again. I, I uh, be praying for all the work to keep going uh, as you as you tour around sharing this great message. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you in Australia later in the year. Um, and we'll have the website up, and registrations are are going to be open. There's expressions of interest now, but registrations open as well. So we'll make sure all the details are there. So thank you, uh, Russ, and thank you, Bob. God bless you both. Thank you, well, thank Shabal. You thank you, everyone, for watching. That's another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Rais, your host. And please visit those websites and, 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 and stay in touch with us. We're going to give you more and more information and updates about the upcoming conference in November. God bless you. Until next time, take care.